Okay, Kate, we're live so you can start. Welcome everyone. As you come in, if you want to just introduce yourself in the chat and we'll begin momentarily. And Sophia, can I just confirm with you you're only seeing the slide? Yes, we okay. can see your slide. Okay, so I'm going to begin now, seeing that everyone is coming in. So welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for coming in today. Um, my name is Sophia Sotomayor. I use the pronoun she, hers. I'm currently living and working on the traditional lands of Tongva, and I am working in the tribal clean water section at EPA. I've been here for a little bit over a year. And today I will be presenting on the 106 reporting qu requirements with Kate Pinkerton. So Kate, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, hi, my name is Kate Pinkerton. I'm also in the tribal clean water section. Been on this team for about six years now and I'm a point of contact for the Clean Water Act Section 106 program in Region 9. Um, and I'm happy to be with you and talking about our reporting requirements today. So next slide. This is an overview of what we'll be covering today. So as I said, topics will include the Clean Water Act 106 program reporting requirements. Uh, and we'll also be going over some different data and assessment tools that are available to assist you in meeting these requirements. So please use the chat function at any time to ask questions and we'll go back over them at the end. So now we're going to go through the sequence of a water quality program. Uh, and this slide might look familiar to you if you've been to a 106 presentation before, but it's an important one. So these steps are important to keep in mind as you work on your Clean Water Act 106 program, whether or not whether you're just starting out or if you've been working on a program for many years. The first step is to identify your goals and objectives of your water quality program. So for example, are you wanting to monitor tribal surface water quality to make sure it's safe to fish, swim and recreate in, or are you more concerned about a specific pollutant and wanna track its impact on your waters? Once you identify your goals and objectives, you will develop a quality assurance project plan, um, also known as a monitoring strategy. And this will outline what you plan to monitor, where you plan to monitor and how you plan to do it. So this will ensure that all the samples that you take and all the data that you collect are of good quality and can be replicated by future staff. Then you will collect all the water quality data and organize it. Uh, for the 106 program, it must be submitted to your project officer in a WQX compatible format, um, which we'll be discussing in a few slides. And you will also then analyze the results and identify any issues or concerns. So do you see any trends? Is there anything exceeding um, the suggested or regulated limits? Like these are questions that you should be asking. And then finally, once you've developed a basic understanding of your surface water quality, you can reevaluate to see if you still have the same goals in mind or if there's anything new you wanna add or change. And the cycle will start all over again. So next, we're going to take a closer look at the three main reporting requirements for your 106 grant. So the first is the quality assurance project plan and monitoring strategy. Um, in other regions, this might be two separate documents, but in region nine, it's usually in one. And then the second is the data in a WQX compatible format. And the third is a water quality assessment report. You might have some other deliverables that you turn in for your 106 grant, depending on the work plan tasks that you propose, but these are the three that are absolutely required for every 106 grant. So the first one, Quality Assurance Project Plan, also known as QAP, um, is required before any monitoring begins using your 106 grant funds. This document is an important resource for guiding your field and lab procedures. 
ensuring the quality of the data that you produce and sustaining your program by providing monitoring protocols for future staff members. There's, these should be reviewed and updated at least every five years. So um, if you end up adding a new monitoring location to your program or a new water quality parameter, um, you may update it sooner than that five-year deadline. Um, and just as you kind of, you know, go through your program, then you can make updates as needed. The QAP should contain your monitoring objectives, design, water quality indicators, uh, data management, analysis and assessment, and then any procedures and protocol for reporting that you have in place. And this chart outlines the approval process that um, you go through for either creating a new QAP or making any revisions. So a tribe will receive assistance from the QA office, um, typically in a scoping meeting to help develop their QAP. And after it is drafted and submitted, it will be reviewed and sent back and forth with necessary comments from your project officer or the QA office uh, until it is finally approved. And you can find links to QAP development assistance on our Region 9 Tribal Water Grants website. So the second main reporting requirement is to submit your water quality monitoring data to your project officer in a WQX compatible format. Uh, and this is typically like an Excel file. And this is an annual requirement. So WQX is the database system that EPA uses to store water quality data. Some of you may know it as Storet. Um, that's what it was formerly known as, but it was decommissioned in June of 2018. So the process for submitting the data hasn't really changed that much for tribes. EPA just stores and retrieves the data a bit differently. Um, the Water Quality Exchange, or WQX, is the mechanism for tribes to submit their data uh, to EPA. And then the Water Quality Portal, or WQP, is the mechanism for anyone, including the public, to retrieve the monitoring data. So there are three main categories of data that should be included when submitting water quality monitoring information. Um, they're displayed here on this slide. So projects like why the data was collected and a brief summary of the monitoring plan, the monitoring locations, which is where the data was collected, um, and all the results should be tied to a specific monitoring location. And then the third is activities and results. So, you know, when, how, and what was collected, measurements of what was monitored. So there are WQX templates available online. Um, an example is shown here. And using this template is a really easy way to make sure your data is compatible with all the reporting requirements. Um, it is optional, so you can use your own spreadsheet or database format if you would prefer. Um, but there are certain required elements that need to be included in order to be considered WQX compatible. So these include, but are not limited to, project name, uh, project identifier, monitoring location, latitude and longitude, um, and more here. They're all listed as the stars on the sheet. So you can see that there's a lot of different requirements. Um, if you submit your data directly into WQX, that will complete this 106 reporting requirement. Um, and then POs can then find the data that you submitted through the water quality data portal. Uh, but you also may need to provide a copy of your data submission confirmation to your project officer. It is not a requirement, again, to submit data into WQX, but it's encouraged uh, and new tools will be are being developed that will help you analyze the data that you submit into the portal. And Kate will be going over some of those later in the presentation. Uh, another tip is it can be helpful to talk to your lab about providing their results in electronic format, such as, an ex such as Excel instead of a PDF. Um, and this will make it easier for you to submit your data in a WQX compatible format. You can even provide this template here to your lab um, so that they can see an example of the type of formatting that you need. 
If you need any help submitting WQX data, you can visit EPA's website um, where there's some training videos that detail, you know, WQX rules and how to submit data um, and other tips like the one shown here. Um, and then there's also contact information for our help desk. So if you have a basic question, a faster way to get information is to chat with us via email. Um, I provided the email to the WQX help desk there. And then you can also request an appointment um, through the help desk or call them. And if you submit an appointment request with dates and times, you should receive a ticket number and meeting invitation as a confirmation. So I encourage you to use those resources if you're having any issues with submitting WQX data. The third 106 reporting requirement is a water quality assessment report. So similar to submitting water quality data, this is currently an annual reporting requirement. The water quality assessment report is a narrative and graphical account of water quality within your tribal boundaries. And it includes a type of water sample, sampling procedures, and resulting data summaries. It also includes the program's interpretation of the data collected and the assessment methodology used. So the water quality assessment report helps EPA measure success towards improvement of water quality in tribal waters. And on the next slide, I'm gonna show you a template that we have that covers most of this information. Um, however, if you choose not to use the template, make sure that you address all of these points. So go ahead to next slide. Um, so here's the template that I was referring to. Um, you can access this on our website and it's in an Excel format. So the template was developed a few years ago to make this reporting requirement a little bit easier, but again, it is not required. Um, it has had some changes over the years. For example, like you can see there's some parameter, ro parameter rows that have been added, um, but it hasn't changed too much in the past few years. So if you have used the template in the last year or two, you can just update it for this year. Uh, and if you have any suggestions for updates to how this template could be more beneficial, always feel free to let us know. Uh, we're open to feedback. And then this slide shows screenshots from two other tabs in the water quality assessment spreadsheet. Um, so the top one is the tab for Atlas of Tribal Waters, which you can think of as kind of an inventory of your surface waters monitored. Um, this shouldn't change too much year to year unless new land or waters are put into trust. And then below is the Atlas, um, is it, or below is a screenshot of the watershed restoration tab. And that is kind of a place to describe which projects you've been implementing to address like specific water quality concerns. And these are often, um, but not always 319 projects. Hi, so uh, I'm just gonna give a brief update about the ATTAINS pilot, which um, is a uh, project that we've been working on for the past couple of years as a potential alternative to the water quality assessment reports. So for the past few years, 12 tribes from region five, six, and nine have participated in this pilot, which is a system, um, attains, uh, is a system that states are required to use for reporting water quality assessments. And this could be, a, as I mentioned, a possible alternative to a water quality assessment report. And here at the top, it's, it shows you that ATTAIN stands for Assessment TMDL Tracking and Implementation System. And this slide is just a timeline of this pilot. Uh, it all started back in 2016, which is five years ago, kind of crazy um, to think it's been that long. And since then there has been multiple rounds of training and most participating tribes have submitted four years worth of assessments and ATTAINS and have been able to reflect on the benefits and challenging challenges of using this system to report water quality assessment information. Based on that feedback uh, via the reflection, the, the pilot was expanded. Last year, a memo was shared nationwide requesting nominations for new participants. 17 new participants from regions one, two, five, 
6, and 8 were identified and paired with existing tribal pilot participants as mentors and training and mentoring on attains and the use of that system and, uh, and assessments and assessment me methodologies have been occurring in 2021. Um, and the this again is a timeline of the project on the bottom kind of shows a, a, a screenshot of what um, the at least the top of the system looks like. And then on the next slide, I wanted to just share a few um, examples of reports that can be generated uh, from the attain system. So this is just uh, one year's worth of information showing the assessments that have been done on various water quality parameters like temperature, fecal coliform, and whether those parameters were meeting uh, the criteria. So um, in attains, you know, it, you when you do your assessments, you could use water quality standards if you have your own tribal water quality standards, or um, you can use EPA recommended criteria. Um, there, there's no necessarily requirement in attains. Um, so in this case, the tribe was using their own water quality standards, and these indicate uh, whether uh, those parameters were meeting or not, which ones, and how many um, locations were meeting or not. And same here with designated uses. So here, the uses for the water were listed as aquatic life, recreational, and drinking water. And um, these, this graph is indicating how many of the assessment units or monitoring locations were fully supporting that use or not supporting or somewhere in between, like not having enough information to do that assessment. So um, I only wanted to briefly cover that update today, but if you have further questions about the Tribal Attains pilot, feel free to reach out to me after this presentation. So um, now we're gonna do a quick quiz just to make sure you're still awake um, I can't see the chat, so hopefully, um, Sophia, I'll take a look. There's any <laughs> uh, but the quiz is what are the three 106 reporting requirements? So, um, go ahead and enter those into the chat if you remember them from just earlier in the presentation or from your 106 program. And I'll pause. Sophia, are we getting any? Maybe people are still typing. <laughs> Let's hope we can get at least one person that nails the, the reporting requirements. I There are no prizes. Maybe if we were in person, there could be prizes. But yeah. virtually, I'm sorry, I can't offer you any prizes. And we can only use the chat function for now. So. If people, oh, there we go. Okay. We have a response in. Um, Patrick says monitoring strategy in QAP, WQX compatible data, and water quality assessment report. So, A. Plus. We Yay. also have some other responses. Um, Arash, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And then Michelle submitted some answers. So. Great. So, few people are awake. That's great. <laughs> A. Plus. Yeah. Passed. <laughs> okay, so, you know, as we just said, good job on the quiz. There are, um, these are the three uh, reporting requirements for the 106 program, the CLAP or the monitoring strategy da data in a STORET or WPX compatible, for compatible format, and a water quality assessment report. Um, and so now I'm just going to briefly cover a few tools that EPA has to offer that can help you uh, with these reporting requirements. You may notice there's no arrow being pointed at the QAP monitoring strategy. Um, just get in touch with your project officer and or the QA office and we can help you um, with any support for the QAPs. Um, as Sophia mentioned, scoping meeting um, tends to help with that. But for the other reporting requirements, here are some tools. So the first is an Excel-based tool to help with submitting data to to WQX, it's called the Tribal Roadmap. It begins with a series of six questions aimed at determining where you're at and collecting, managing, submitting, and submitting your water quality data. Um, for example, some questions you might have be asked are, you know, do you have an org ID and a user ID for WQX, or how do you record your water quality monitoring field data? Um, sometimes the response might 
B, I don't know, like if you don't know what the org ID is. So um, after you answer those six questions, you receive a customized document that guides you through the WQX data submission process. So if you didn't have an org ID or didn't know what that was, the guide will tell you who to contact to check or um, get one. And if you answer that your data is not in a WQ, QX compatible format, or you don't know what your import configuration is, the guide provides directions for where to find tutorials and other resources about how to do that. And it's helpful for maintaining information or retrieving it during periods of staff turnover or for advancing your program to another level. Um, and a second part of the tool allows you to retrieve information that already exists in WQX or st store it. So, um, New Year's new users can get an idea of what's already in there before taking that next step. So there's also interesting summary information, such as a min, max, average, and number of stations by water body type, which could be helpful for completing the water atlas in your water quality assessment report. You can also map the monitoring stations uh, using an external application such as Google Earth or ArcGIS, and there's also some basic graphing capabilities um, in this tool as well. Some of the other tools also have this capability. So you cannot use this second part of the tribal roadmap if there's no data in WQX. So the, the second part is contingent on having data in um, WQX. The first part you can use no matter what. So the second tool I wanted to cover briefly is the SP14B tool. This tool and all the other tools we're talking about can be found on our website. And I think we've included links on most of our slides, but perhaps not this one. So um, this tool is designed to allow for simple discovery of water quality monitoring data and comparison of that data against basic numeric criteria. So it was developed in part to evaluate this uh, former measure called the SP14B 14 14 measure that uh, was demonstrating that a monitoring station was maintaining water quality. However, um, this tool is generally helpful for water quality data assessment, especially against criteria if you have water quality standards or intend to, for example, participate in the TAMES pilot that I just mentioned. Um, and it also uses uh, the WQX data. So if you haven't entered data into WQX, um, you would need to do that first before using this tool. Um, so when you download, download this Excel-based tool from our website, you must first retrieve a list of monitoring stations to evaluate against. Uh, this is done by using the stations tab on the Excel spreadsheet. So on this screen on the bottom left, you can see that the stations tab is open. Maybe you can see it. It's kind of small in Excel elements, but um, if you're full screen, you might be able to see it and use the search form. So um, you can search by organization or HUC or lat long coordinates. Um, the most common approach would be to search by org ID. So that's your tribe, tribe's identification name that was given to upload data to WQX. Um, for example, this one um, is Cherokee underscore WQX. And if you have many stations, you might wanna limit your search by a specific geography like HUC um, like eight digit huck or X amount of distance from a lot long coordinate. And then you must at, at least enter, you must at least enter one of the criteria to conduct a search. Um, and so your next step would be to select a specific station um, before you do any uh, data analysis. And you um, will also want to select the parameter that you're doing the analysis for analysis for. So for example, ammonia or DO, and then you have the, um, then you can enter upper and lower limits. So you only need to enter one um, in some cases, for example, like pH, you might have an upper and a lower limit to enter, um, but you only need to enter a minimum of one to do the analysis. And these could be your tribal water quality standards, or these could be, you know, EPA recommended criteria. So after you click Analyze, uh, this tool will take you to an analysis tab and it's where you can find the data for the site you selected over the date range indicated. There will be values in blue, um, that's the most variable amount on this slide, but also a trend line in purple and then uh, a line for the limit you set in either green and or red, depending if you set an upper and 
lower limit. You can also find some summary statistics such as mean, max, and number of times the values exceeded the limits you set. So as you can see here in this example, the pH values um, in blue never exceeded the limits of 6 and 8.5 on this graph. And um, you can see that in terms of the exceedances, upper and lower limit on the counts as well on the left side of this slide. So you can also save analysis and then um, save this document for later if you need to refer to it. So the last tool I'm gonna go over is the data discovery tool. This uses our software and your internet browser to view QC and summarize, summarize data that exists in WQX. So anyone who's unfamiliar with for anyone who's unfamiliar with R, it's a free open source program that typically uses coding for its analysis, but you don't need coding experience for this um, tool because most of the interface takes place in your internet browser. So this is what the, you know, the screenshot is the interface that you would be using, not um, any sort of coding. And it was developed by headquarters, EPA headquarters and released in the past few years. It's um, been updated with new features um, and you can, some include, you know, you can filter for non-detects or duplicates. Um, and uh, it also gives you some basic summary statistics like some of the other tools that I've mentioned. Um, here's some graphing uh, capabilities of this tool and mapping as well. Um, on the left side, uh, you know, for example, this those bubbles will get bigger if there's more sample sizes there. Um, so it can show like a high concentration of data potentially. Um, and then you can also have um, some other graphing capabilities such as sampling frequency and um, pie charts that break down all the parameters that you're sampling for at a station. So I'm going to now hand it over to Sophia. Hi again. So now I'm going to talk really briefly about um, determining what parameters to consider monitoring when developing your 106 program. So under the current 106 guidance, uh, tribes are required to report the nine parameters listed here in a WQX format, but recognize that it may not be possible to collect all the, the information on all nine parameters, especially for newer programs that are just starting up. Um, these nine core parameter requirements are expected to change in the 106 guidance update that is currently undergoing right now, that we're currently undergoing right now. Um, which I'll get to at the end of this presentation. We expect to shift towards monitoring what makes sense for the tribe rather than outlining specific parameter requirements. So the parameters listed on the left are the core parameters that we suggest to get a program going. This is a great starting point if you're looking for how to begin, begin monitoring on a water body not yet monitored. Uh, so for instance, if you're looking to obtain you know, much of your water from groundwater wells, but have never tested any of your groundwater for contaminants, um, conducting these parameter tests might be a good priority to start out with. Um, or if you know that there are wetlands on your reservation, but have never cataloged them, this is a really good initial monitoring point to start to assess their health. Um, and then generally the parameters in the middle and to the right are more complex and may make sense to add um, to each water body as tribal capacity builds, you know, as there's more trainings taken and technical assistance um, or pur purchasing of more laboratory equipment. Um, and then I also wanted to go over these parameter fact sheets, um, which were recently developed by headquarters um, and just released in the last couple months. And this provides an introduction to monitoring co these common parameters. So they cover eight of the nine core parameters that I just went over, including temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, macroinvertebrates, E. coli, and nutrients. Um, and here's some examples of what they look like. They're, most of them are a couple pages and they're a very helpful resource. Um, they're available at the link below, so I recommend that you look, um, you take a look at them, especially if you're interested in adding one of them to your monitoring program. Uh, and these will likely also be incorporated in the 106 guidance revision. Um, we're not sure where we're going to see them in that yet, but um, we'll be talking about that again at the end. 
So the only parameter fact sheet that is not yet available of the nine core parameters that um, we expect to come out pretty soon is habitat assessment. Um, I've listed a few habitat parameters here that can be used for rating criteria for habitat, such as channel alteration, channel flow status, vegetative protection, and stream bottom characteristics. Uh, there are some manuals that are available to assist in monitoring this indicator, um, but EPA does not have any specific recommended criteria for habitat condition. So there's some links on this slide um, to resources that have developed methods for assessing and rating habitat conditions. Uh, state agency protocols can also be a really helpful tool. Um, so it's important just to consider your objectives um, to determine which habitat assessment protocol is most appropriate for your program. And we'll go next. So um, this is a website that we've linked here for more EPA water quality tools. Um, not all of these tools may be applicable to the work that you do or the program that you have, but it's a good place to start if you're looking for additional EPA water tools. So for example, under ambient water quality, the MPDHA tool um, uses a variety of data sources like WQX, um, USGS Sparrow modeling, et cetera to provide information on nitrogen and phosphorus loading amounts, impairments, and uh, total maximum daily loads. And then the stormwater calculator listed on the website um, accesses several national databases that provide soil, topography, rainfall, and evaporation information for the chosen site. So as the user, you will supply all the information about the site's land cover, um, and select the type of low impact development controls that you would like to use. And then we're gonna talk really briefly about the 106 guidance revision. Um, so the timeline so far is that January 13th, earlier this year, uh, the notification on consultation and coordination of the guidance was sent out. And then the first comment period occurred from January to March. And most recently, we've had a call for tribal volunteers to be a part of sub work groups. Um, so there were 25 volunteer slots, and all of these have at least one regional um, tribal rep working on the sub work group. So keep your eyes out upcoming for the draft revised guidance. We're expecting this uh, in January of 2022, and there will also be a comment period for this. Um, so that's kind of like the next steps in the guidance process. Um, and we also have Danielle Angelis here and Kate Pinkerton who have been working with our team on all the guidance updates from headquarters if you have any more specific questions. So with that, that is the end of our presentation. Uh, you can go ahead and contact Kate or I about any specific questions that come up after this. And we'll be taking some questions now if you want to enter any in the chat. So, so far, Trisha has said, please put the fact sheets in the chat. I can go ahead and do that now. And we'll give it a couple minutes for questions to funnel in. Oh, it looks like Heidi might have done it. Did she put it in? Yeah. Okay. I and stopped sharing so I could see. <laughs> Thanks. And yes, thank you, Heidi. Um, throughout the annual conference, if you have any questions, go ahead and message Kate and I. Uh, and we can also put our contact information in the chat. Um. 
You know, I may just mention, Danielle, yell at me if I shouldn't be saying this, but, um, you know, we talked about how the water quality assessment report is currently an annual requirement. That's actually one of the things that's up for consideration in this 106 guidance revision is potentially making that an every two year requirement. So um, just keep an eye out for that if that's something you're interested in commenting on um, when the draft comes out. which would align more, sorry, I'll just add, which would align a little bit more with, so I talked about the TAINS pilot, currently states submit their assessments every two years. So um, that two, every two year requirement um, would align a little bit more with what states do. <clears throat> so I, uh, just to add, um, no, Kate, I wouldn't yell at you for that. I think that's a great point. Um, the whole idea behind the 106 guidance is, is one that it came out in 2006. So it, it, it does have some outdated links, um, outdated information. And so we really wanted to update that. The second part is to really uh, focus more on tribal priorities. We, we do discuss EPA priorities, but also look at, you know, trying to be as flexible as possible with the 106 program to uh, implement tribal priorities. Um, and so, you know, if you had read the guidance, which I'm sure most of you have and memorized, um, we had talked a lot about the fundamental intermediate and mature sort of sections and, and were one of the big changes is we are getting rid of that because it may not make sense for your water quality program. Um, and we saw that um, some tribes were were monitoring certain parameters because they felt like they needed to since it was considered mature. So um, something to think about, We the purpose of the guidance was to make it a lot more flexible. Um, and so uh, we look forward to sharing the draft document with all of you, um, as well as receiving comments, um, what Kate mentioned, if you really want to report annually, um, you know, let us know that too. Um, so that's it. Yes, thank you, Danielle, for bringing that up. Um, Hey, there's a question in the chat from Eric Wright that says, interested in attains, where do we get more information on that? You, um, well, you can contact me. I don't think we have a, there's a, I, I mean, I think there's a website for it. Um, but if you have any specific questions, feel free to email me. I think our contact information is in this session and I'm happy to provide more details about what's going on with that. Um, also, um, Hoopa is the Region 9 participant in the TAINS pilot, so you could also um, reach out to uh, Hoopa for more information about their experience. Yeah. Hopefully they don't get mad that I talked about that. <laughs> and a lot of the tribes that are working on the current pilot as like the mentor and kind of mentee or like just amazing and super helpful. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we could put you in touch if you have any other questions if, or if you're more interested in joining the program. Um, Iris said, are all nine core parameters required in the reporting for 106? So Iris, that's a great question. Um, as I kind of mentioned, you know, it's a very flexible, um, Kind of like requirement uh, that's in the current guidance and it doesn't necessarily expect tribes to be monitoring all nine um and you know it it is in the old guidance so we're expecting to see this change in the upcoming one and it will not likely be required to have all nine of them but like danielle was saying kind of using only the parameters that make sense for your program and kind of are meeting your objectives um so you know doing more what makes sense for the tribe um i hope that answers your question a bit
And yes, Fawn's, um, the PowerPoint is under the documents tab. So after this presentation, if anybody wants to access any of the links or go back and look at any of the information, um, that will be in the documents tab. And there will also be a recording available so you can go back and reference anything that we talked about. And Kate and I will stay on and just hang out like if any more questions come out, uh, come in the chat. Um, Patrick asked, is there some kind of directory of EPA approved labs? The lab I use for sample analysis isn't ideal. Kate, do you want to take that one? I, yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of one um we could check within with our qa office to see if they have some sort of list i i haven't heard of that um my best recommendation would be to talk to tribes near you geographically to see what labs they use and if they're enjoying them or not <laughs> or if they're working for them but i i'll also check in with the qa office and so i'll write your name. yeah we can follow up um, on that question. No, we're not allowed to, you know, recommend specific contractors. So I, this may fall into that category. Um, and so again, it, don't hold your breath for a response from us. I'd probably start asking other tribes. Looking at the chat, we got some feedback from Michelle. I think she was referencing Kate's um, comment about the water quality assessment report being a bi-annual or like every two year requirement. I support that idea. So good to know. And we'll, EPA will be in contact in your project office there. Like there will be a lot of um, notifications sent out about the 106 guidance next comment period when it's free. Well, seeing no other questions, um, Again, you can always contact Caterai. Um, our information is in the session. And Heidi, should we? Let's see. Oh, Mike Shaver. Uh, the roadmap wizard for WQX submissions doesn't appear to be working for me. The macros won't enable, or my security system may be blocking. Okay. Well, good thing I am Mike's PO, so I can try to troubleshoot that with you. Yes, and sometimes it can be a little bit tricky because for certain tools, you need to have the macros enabled on Excel. So, um, you know, so usually it'll pop up as a bar at the top of Excel right when you open up the sheet and just make sure to click enable. Um, and if you have any like specific issues with that, your project officer can refer you to us or help you themselves um, troubleshooting those kind of issues. And I think Fonz has a recommendation for Patrick for a lab. So that works out well, hopefully. <laughs> 
Northern California. This is Heidi here. I thought I would just pop in to say, Patrick or anyone else that is interested in finding out labs, why don't you go to the water lounge and put that question in? And I bet you'll get a ton of different responses from tribes for like different areas. So that's one way that you can find some nearby labs. That's a great suggestion, Heidi. You know, I feel like it's annual conference and all these um, little conference session rooms that Heidi's talking about are a really good way to crowdsource and share information. We're wrapping up in a few minutes here. So if you have any lingering questions, go ahead and add them to the chat. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everybody that joined today and taking time to listen to our presentation. Um, we hope it was helpful. <laughs> and maybe you learned a couple new things about 106 um, reporting requirements. Yep. Thanks for listening and thanks for your engagement. Yes. Some great quiz responses. I do. Do we stop the broadcast or do you? Or maybe we just wait another minute. <laughs> I'll stop it. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi.